The live is up. Sergeants, can you start your recordings, please? Computer recording is up. Cloud is good. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Lugo, can you give us the opening, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Contracts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Kalos, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on Contracts. My name is Ben Kalos and I'm the chair of this committee. For those of you who are watching remotely, please feel free to participate in the hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. Before I dive in, I'd like to recognize my colleagues on the committee who are joining us today. Uh, today, we are joined by Council Member Barron, Council Member Joe and I, Council Member Rosenthal. Today, we'll be hearing two bills that were introduced yesterday on Earth Day. The first bill, Introduction 2271, relates to environmental preferable purchasing by city agencies. The second introduction 2272 relates to agencies buying textiles. Both bills aim to utilize the city's immense purchasing power to support the ambitious environmental goals being pursued by this council and which are vital if we're going to have any chance of taking on this climate emergency. The first bill, introduction 2271, updates the city's environmental preferable purchasing laws. Uh, this collection of laws were first passed uh, in 2005 and actually authored by now Mayor Bill de Blasio. They haven't been amended since 2011 and many of the stand wires haven't, standards haven't been updated since 2012 and still today have guidelines on purchasing cassette tapes, mini discs, VCRs and answering machines. I'm not sure of the last time I've seen any of them other than in a uh, meme uh, for folks of my generation. In addition to changes in how we consume our music, research on climate change, our impact on it, and ways to mitigate negative effects change drastically. And so jokes aside, it's vital that our laws keep pace. Introduction 2271 therefore makes updates to the city's purchase of light bulbs, electronic products, green cleaning supplies, and furniture to ensure that the most efficient and least harmful products make it through the procurement process. In addition to updating these procurement standards, the bill also mandates additional reporting by the director. The goal of these changes is to improve public oversight of the process so that updates can be tracked and maybe even improved. Importantly, the bill also updates the language of the EPP to more clearly reflect the newly established innovations within the green economy. For instance, instead of simply reducing waste or relying on recycling, the bill makes clear that the city can now use its purchasing power to pursue the end, of, end goal of zero waste and net zero greenhouse gas emissions. The second bill we are hearing feedback on today, Introduction 2272, applies these aspirations to the city's procurement of textile products. Textiles are some of the most reusable items in the waste stream, and yet they continue to be sent to landfills. Fashion and garment companies across the world, including H&M, Stella McCartney, and Burberry, are committing to moving the industry towards circularity, whether that be by taking responsibility for their products after consumers have finished using them, or by only using materials that can be fully broken down and remanufactured into new items. As a key player in the international garment industry, New York City is uniquely positioned to lead this important environmental change and why I support the procurement of more environmental sustainable textiles by city agencies. We know that DCAS makes purchases for things like uniforms and blankets. We also have a large pile of police and fire departments that utilize textiles. As a global fashion capital, New York City also has key industry players with expertise on how the global textile supply chain operates, the environmental changes being implemented. I believe that these experts, along with representatives from the city's agencies, are best positioned to guide a new set of procurement standards for city's purchase of textile products. In 20, introduction 2272 would therefore be first require the director of citywide environmental purchasing to report on the city's purchase of textile goods. The task force would established by this bill would then be asked to make recommendations on the environmentally preferred uh, purchasing, use, and disposal of textiles by city agencies. With the updates, the EPP, and the potential to improve the city's purchase of textile products, I hope that we can fully capitalize on the city's purchasing power. 
As a multi-billion dollar consumer, the city has a huge impact on the market, the purchases we make, and the standards we set as incentives and help, help drive innovation. I think that I thank the administration for coming today and look forward to hearing their feedback on these bills. Uh, before I invite them to testify, I'd like to take a moment to thank Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Council, uh, Josh Kingsley, who's been uh, filling in. And uh, I think this is our last hearing with him and we wanna thank him for his great service. Uh, we certainly have not slowed down. <laughs> We've been doing a lot. Policy analyst, uh, Leah Skripiak, uh, who's been really taking charge on this and working with uh, the fashion community finance analyst, Frank Sarno, uh, finance unit head, John Russell, for all their hard work putting this together. I'd also like to thank uh, the staff within the bill drafting unit, Nick Connell, uh, Sarah Ginsburg, Jessica Steinberg, Alvin, and Wes Jones, who have spent a number of months drafting the bills we're hearing today, and my counsel, Wilfredo Lopez, for his work with this committee. Now turn it over to our moderator committee counsel, Josh Kingsley, to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair Kalos. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Josh Kingsley, Counsel of the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I'd want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you in order. Please note that for the ease of the virtual hearing, there will, be not, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of the questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit their written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, the first round of testimony will be given by the administration, as Chair Kalis mentioned. Um, this will be uh, on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, uh, Kizzy Charles Guzman, who's the Director of Social and Environmental Policy. Um, from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Ms. Jennifer Geeling, who's the Deputy Director of Policy and Partnerships. And finally, from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Mercida Ebrick, who's the Deputy Commissioner uh, in the Office of Citywide Procurement and Chief Diversity Officer. Sorry if I got that title wrong. Um, before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Um, please raise your hand and I will call on you each individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Deputy Director Charles Guzman? Yes, I do. Thank you so much. Deputy Director Geeling? Yes, I do. Thank you. And finally, uh, Deputy Commissioner Ebrick? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you all, and you can begin testifying. Go ahead. Okay, I guess I'm going first. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chair Callos and members of the Committee on Contracts. My name is Casey Charles Guzman. I am the Deputy Director for Social and Environmental Policy at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability. I will provide testimony on the role that our office uh, plays as it relates to environmentally preferable purchasing. The Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability works across inside and outside of the city government to reach our one NYC 2050 goals, namely reaching carbon neutrality by 2050, ensuring 100% clean energy by 2040 and achieving zero waste. We recognize that we must lead by example in large and small ways, and that includes making sure that the goods and services we purchase are as sustainable as possible. This week, for example, we announced that we will transition to an all electric school bus fleet by 2030, in recent years, we've also implemented executive orders that reduce our purchase of unnecessary single-use plastics and commit to an all-electric city fleet by 2040. The Environmentally Preferable Purchasing EPP program has been in place since 2005, as you heard. And as my colleague from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services will describe, uh, it embeds criteria into our purchasing decisions that prioritize human and environmental health. EPP standards seek to reduce waste energy and water use, greenhouse gas emissions, hazardous substances, and also to improve indoor air quality and increase recycled and reuse content. Our office is currently working with MOX to complete a review of the standards as required by Local Law 118 of 2005, and MOX plans to promulgate updates later this year. Our role is to advise MOX on the most innovative products and approaches available in the market, and to provide well-researched recommendations on any additions or changes of the standards. 
We researched and compiled the latest industry standards issued by the EPA and other governmental and non-governmental bodies, review federal and state guidance, and evaluate other cities and states' EPP approaches so that we can recommend ways in which the city standards can be strengthened. We must also ensure that a minimum number of vendors is available to potentially provide a product that meets the updated standard. We plan to draft the recommendations by the end of the spring and deliver them to MOCS, which will then review and finalize them before initiating the CAPA process to promulgate the updated standards. I will now turn to introductions 2271 and 2272. We appreciate the council member's focus uh, in introduction 2271 on expanding EPP to include new categories of goods, including types of computer equipment and furniture. We support green procurement and believe that the goals of this bill are laudable. When we review the EPP standards for updates, we consider adding new categories of goods and we agree that the standards should reflect the latest environmental research and state of the industry across all categories of goods. Achieving a zero waste future in the textile industry as well as across the industries from which we procure good will require a massive investment and transformation throughout the supply chain. As introduction 2272 acknowledges, the research in this area is in its very early stages and not enough data exists today to understand the full economic, social and environmental implications of transitioning to a fully circular textile system and fully circular economy. But we look forward to working with the council, environmental experts and certainly the industry to identify ways to better understand our supply chain, embed cutting edge technology, um, and sustainability practices across our purchasing and identify approaches to increase the utilization and impact of EPP to achieve greater environmental and energy efficiency goals. All of our actions as a city play a part in our fight against the climate crisis, especially at the close of Earth Week, we appreciate the opportunity to discuss our efforts to improve sustainability through EPP, improving the health of our employees, our facilities, and the entirety of our supply chain. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with the council on these issues. Thank you. Uh, in between the testimonies, I'd like to acknowledge we've been joined by council member Perkins and Gennaro. Please continue. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the contracts committee. My name is Jennifer Guiling, and I serve as a deputy director at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, MOX. Thank you for inviting us to speak with you today during Earth Week on the city's efforts to further build sustainability and environmental awareness into city functions such as procurement. The Environmentally Preferable Purchasing Laws, EPP, are a set of local laws intended to limit negative health and environmental impacts through strategic procurement sourcing and baseline purchasing standards. EPP laws address a range of issues, including waste production, energy and water use, greenhouse gas emissions, indoor air quality, recycled and reused content, and the presence of hazardous substances. As we have testified previously, MOX plays an oversight role in citywide procurement. In this role, we have focused attention on establishing a centralized, standard, and digital procurement and sourcing solutions portal, Passport, that incorporates and facilitates procurement rules, activities, and compliance. Passport has enabled our agency and citywide procurement to move away from manual paper-based practices to automated digital procedures. In the case of EPP Local Law 118, managing EPP compliance is now integrated into Passport, whereby the system prompts agencies to affirm compliance with the law as applicable. Failure to address EPP compliance questions will block the agency from moving forward with the procurement. This automation of practice allows our city agency partners to focus more on strategic sourcing that can further the goals of EPP laws. Here again, Passport, the procurement sourcing and solutions portal is poised to be a critical tool. With more than 27,000 vendors in Passport, city agencies have access to a breadth of suppliers to further the intent of the EPP legislation. Additionally, Passport can facilitate pre-qualified lists 
that agencies may develop to further narrow in on vendors that have the ability and expertise to reach EPP goals. MOX's role to promulgate rules under Local Law 118 is chiefly a coordinating position. We partner with the Mayor's Office of Climate and Sustainability, MOS, who leads the research effort to propose updates to the rules. Our colleagues are well-versed on prevailing and emerging environmental efforts and perfectly positioned to engage industry and policy leaders. An update to the existing standards is currently underway. MOS is supporting the analysis of current standards, which we will then collectively bring to agency stakeholders for input. Once that review has been completed, MOX will move the rule changes through the CAPA process for public comment and finalization. Assigning MOX the role of creating guidelines for textile purchasing under intro 2272 would create the same relationship, coordinating work that is really led outside our agency where the expertise exists. Finally, intro 2271 and 2272 include reporting responsibilities for MOX, another coordinating activity. MOX has long served in central reporting roles, collecting information from the business owners, in this case, contracting agencies, and consolidating into reports. In the case of Local Law 118, MOX collects data on EPP covered goods and construction contracts and compiles this information in the annual indicators report using surveys that are distributed to agencies each year. As part of the publication process, MOX works with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, to gather data regarding goods contracts and compiles it along with the data on construction contracts to publish the report. This report reflects the total value of goods and construction contracts entered into by any agency that are covered by the EPP standards. With regard to the legislation introduced today, MOX defers to its colleagues on the nature of the data points and the request for past contracting information. However, we do wanna suggest an alternative view of reporting in the age of passport. The surveys and manual document submission that currently comprise the EPP reporting structure will be a thing of the past in the near future. Today, procurement is more transparent and accessible than ever before. The public portal hosts citywide solicitations that may be sorted by commodity, industry, and agency for review by anyone to understand how procurements are taking sustainability and environmental impact into consideration and rolling up EPP requirements and rules. Passport ushers in an opportunity to reconsider, streamline, and enhance the data and information that traditionally was necessary to collect in an opaque and decentralized environment. Today, we can fully maximize tools such as the Passport Public Portal to further highlight sustainability requirements. Thank you for calling this hearing today. We appreciate bringing attention to environmental and sustainability concerns. We are proud that Passport furthers these goals by eliminating paper and the delivery of hard copies of documents. I'm joined by my colleagues from MOS and DCAS. We would be happy to take any questions you have at this time. Thank you very much for your testimony. One moment, please. So let's start with a, a pretty big picture question, which is just in government, if no one's, if everyone's responsible for something, no one's responsible for things and they can fall through the cracks. So, uh, this law written by Mayor de Blasio requires there to be a director of citywide environmental purchasing. Can you identify who that is by name, please? Uh, 
pardon the background noise, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, the MOX director, Dan Simon. Okay. And um, it, I guess, so if we're doing a hearing on this local law and the MOX director, Dan Simon, is the citywide environmental purchasing director. Um, what I guess, Jennifer, what is your role within the within Mox, and, and why not have the director here? Uh, so I'm a deputy director, part of the executive team at Mox, and often have the pleasure of testifying uh, with uh, your committee, uh, Chair Kalos. So I guess, in terms of making sure that we comply with local law. Uh, 118 and environmental purposeful purchasing. Where is the buck stop? Who's responsible for making sure that the agencies follow those uh, rules? So um, with uh, the advent of Passport, we've been able to automate, um, as I mentioned in the testimony, and digitize the ability for agencies to attest to their compliance. Uh, so they now do that in the system, and if um, there's no way to bypass those screens, if you don't answer the questions, you can't move forward uh, with the procurement. We also um, manage a procurement training institute, which is a training for the city's procurement professionals uh, so that they learn uh, the rules, regulations, and activities involved in citywide procurement that include EPP laws. Uh, so we ensure that that is uh, part of the curriculum for our procurement professionals uh, as well. And then we also collect the information that the agencies um, provide us with and uh, consolidate, consolidate that into a report that we then publish. With regard to the standards uh, and the reporting that is in, in the EPP law, uh, when is the last time those uh, standards were updated. I think you mentioned in your opening remarks that they were updated in 2012 and we've been working with um, MOS uh, to update them um, and hope to have an update com coming very soon uh, by the end of this year. Um, and that, that uh, engagement with MOS has been going for uh, quite some time. So we're looking forward to sharing updates and uh, appreciate your attention to the matter and agree that it is time uh, for them to be updated. Uh, my understanding is under the law, it was supposed to be updated every two years. Uh, is the update that is happening from MOX and MOS are a result of uh, council action in this area? Uh, so uh, we've been working together on updating them for before this hearing was called. Um, but again, appreciate you know the the partnership and uh, collaboration and and raising it uh, through a hearing. But uh, and the conversation and the work um, has been happening for uh, quite some time. And I'm uh, happy to defer to my colleagues too for more information around um, the updating of the current standards. Sure, would love to hear from MLS. Sure, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so my understanding is that updates are not required by the law, but the legislation states that the standards are to be reviewed every two years and updated if the updates are deemed to be necessary. We couldn't agree with you more that it is more than due time to update them. Uh, we are excited to be doing this work and we have been uh, conducting this research alongside a small team um, of our staff um, for months now, so for a few months. And so we hope again uh, to uh, deliver a set of recommendations to MOC so that we can have updates by the end of this year. Um, there's been a lot of innovation in the meantime and we wanna make sure that those changes are reflected. We've been working on this update to the law since uh... 2020, since last year, since actually 2019 when I became contract chair. Uh, did your review and updates begin before or after we began working on this legislation and notified Mox and City Hall that we were looking at this issue? Uh, I am not sure. I am not sure. 
Um, I have to say that obviously in the last uh, year of 2020, we had a lot um, of activity going on in the city and a lot of projects that uh, were brand new to our office, especially. Um, uh, we delivered air conditioners to low-income New Yorkers uh, and were part of the emergency management response uh, for months on end. Um, so yes, some of this research was ongoing, but we have dedicated more comprehensive attention to this issue uh, this year in 2021. So did you do engage in the review process in 2014? Uh, that uh, predates my stay at MOS, so I don't have the answer awesome. to that question. It predates me too, council member. <laughs> you engage in the, re in the review in 2016. But we can, we can definitely circle back on details of the timeline. I, I, I actually, I don't have that information in front of me, uh, but. So I, if this part was a softball, like, I, I believe that we've been working on this for a while. We let you know we were working on it and you're doing what you're supposed to, which is making sure that you, you're, as we call attention to something that had been ignored for pretty much a decade that we're doing, gonna do right by it. But it, it kind of sucks to be told though we were working on it on our own when it just, and you don't have the answers to to show that you were actually already working on it when I, I, I what, what did the review occur in 2020? The review has been occurring in our office since 2018. Listen, I think we're, what we're saying is we consistently- Okay, so but in 2018, that. you looked at that document from 2012 and said it is still important for us to regulate cassettes, VCRs, mini discs. I have to tell you, Chair Callis, that I have also seen in some of our agencies typewriters. So we procure the, a variety of equipment <laughs> across city government, and we are really excited to updating standards to ensure that everything that we're procuring is meeting the latest uh, EPA and energy efficiency standards. So I guess in 2018, why wasn't it worth updating the standards? We submitted uh, recommendations to MOX in 2018. Uh, MOX, so they, the standards were supposed to be updated in 2018. Why didn't they get updated in 2018? There were recommendations submitted. So I'll, we'll have to come back, uh, Chair Kalos, with an answer for that. Um, and look back at uh, what was submitted in 2018. And, um, you know, we worked closely with MOS and our agency partners. Uh, so I, I'm happy to circle back with you to find out you know, this precise timeline, what was submitted, what the activity was um, and why it's still ongoing. Is this the first time MOX is being asked about the standards, where the standards are and why they haven't been updated? For EPP? Yes. Uh, this is the first time that I've been in front of you uh, for the contracts committee. Um, I know that we've been uh, reviewing the recommendations and have been working with MOS to update the standards um, and uh, you know appreciate you know the urgency um, in part uh, because it has been some time. Um, uh, and so, um, as I mentioned before, uh, moving to release those standards uh, in the coming months. Uh, to both of you, would you agree that we have a climate emergency? Absolutely. Mox? Yes. We support, you know, that's one of the big drivers behind Passport, right? No, we, we can't, we can't, if recommendations were provided in, in 2018, it can't take three years to adopt standards. Uh, after you adopt the standards in 2021, will you be doing a review in 2022? We, can, we will continue to review um, as is you know, required by the law or, or we deem necessary or you know, in partnership with leaders in, in the sector and certainly with the leadership of MOS um, who's on the front lines of understanding what is um, you know, really best practices around uh, sustainability and environmental protection. Is the director of MOX the right person to have the title of director of citywide environmental purchasing? Mox has a lot of responsibilities. The director of Mox was uh, highly involved in procuring PPE 
um, it is, it, it seems, it, I, I know that this administration likes to pile multiple titles onto individuals, but it is the mayor's office of contract services director, the right person to be the director of citywide environmental purchasing. Uh, should, should it be a separate and apart position so that they wake up every day and the only thing they're focused on is the environment? Uh, who, who, what, what is the right role? Who is the right person? Or, or, or right agency? Uh, I think that's probably for both of us. I can uh, respond on behalf of um, Mox to say that we are, we're happy to discuss changes um, in, in roles for, um, and happy to have that conversation. Um, with you and, and um, the committee. And I don't know if MOS has a perspective on that. Um, I, I mean, I defer to our colleagues at MOX. We, our role at MOS is, is advisory. We do, um, you know, do this research and support, um, you know, environmental policy making by any agency that wants us, right? Um, that said, we're not named anywhere in, uh, in the legislation, and uh, we do make it our business to continue to engage with every agency to make sure that their practices are as sustainable as they can be. Uh, but we don't have uh, a real understanding of, of contracts and purchasing. We obviously don't do that on behalf of the city, and so there's a lot of nuance and, and information that we are not um, as privy to in order to be able to uh, make the right call. How much of the city's procurement of its $22 billion in contracts uh, goes through the Environmental Preferable Purchasing Program? So the, the annual reports council uh, member on um, our website. So you can find the data on our website. I don't have that uh, in my mind ahead or um, right now, but it's on the website. And note that um, the EPP uh, rules and regulations apply to a subset of the total um, procurement for the city, according to the legislation. So um, that information is all public. It's all available on the MOX website in our reports. Sure. So just to be clear to folks watching at home, uh, you have to go to www.nyc.gov slash site slash mox slash index dot page. Click on reporting. Uh, sorry, not reporting. You have to click, you have to click reporting, then you have to click data publications. And then on the page, there is something that says indicators appendices on that page. And then if you click on that page, Appendix E has environmental preferable purchasing, which includes an Excel file. Um, I actually wanna thank Mox because be, as in preparation for this hearing, because we, we do preparation and uh, we do meet with agencies ahead of time to, to make sure we all get on the same page. Uh, we were able to, to find it. I'll, I'll be honest, it is not easy to find. And part of the reason I just shared it with folks is so that anyone at home who would be going to the website could actually find it too. Um, so I, I, I did go there before this hearing and uh, I believe that um, of our $22 billion contracts budget, only $411 million was included in environmental preferable purchasing according to your fiscal year 2020 report, Appendix E is that Correct. Hi, uh, thank you. Sorry for the delays and muting. Um, uh, so uh, the reports, um, if uh, as published on the, the website are accurate and correct. And um, I can uh, defer to my colleagues uh, for more information and insight into um, the reports. As I mentioned uh, earlier, they cover um, goods and construction. Um, so it's a subset of uh, the procurement uh, purchasing across the city.
And I just wanted to add one thing. I appreciate you referencing the MOX uh, website and that particular place because there's an abundance of reports that are available on that uh, page and a lot more information about Passport as well. So thank you, uh, Chair Kalos, for mentioning that. So how much of the uh, $22 billion budget on contracts do you think should be going through environmental preferable purchasing? Or do you think that 411 million is the right number? So um, that the number that's reported uh, that is in the reports is um, the number that applies to the amount of purchasing uh, that is that pertains to the uh, the rules and regulations and law. It's um, uh, as I mentioned before, it's just, it's a subset of procurement. It's it's just sort of a, a, a factual report of um, the application of the EPP laws to procurement um, as they're currently as they currently stand. So I guess the cons the question is: so if you go to the Department of Citywide Administrative Services (DCAS), and I see we've got. Uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Mercida Everick, uh, my understanding is in fiscal year 2020, DCAS procured $1.8 billion in goods. Uh, does that sound correct? Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct. So um, I guess the question is why more, why all 1.8 billion or at least more of that 1.8 billion for goods didn't go through environmental preppable purchasing. Sure, yeah. This is a DCAS question or a MOX question or an MOS question. And also part of this hearing is uh, trying to find out who the product owner is. I, I can totally take this one. And then if, the, if my colleagues wanna add it, they can feel free. Um, yeah, so when you look at our total spend uh, for everything that we buy, not everything is applicable to the current EPP standards. So in FY20, for example, a lot of our procurement were emergency procurements in response to COVID. Emergency procurements as a method are exempt from EPP. So you've got to take those, those figures out and that's because we need product in hand immediately. And so we can't guarantee that a standard is going to be applied in those specifications at the time of purchase. It may be possible that we are also buying things that are environmentally preferable, but th that entire universe is not subject to EPP. And then there are other categories of spend, which are large dollar spends for us that are also not included in EPP. So for example, fuel, uh, office furniture, uh, our entire fleet, those are currently not in our EPP standards. But what I want to, you know, really take the time to stress here, and, I, and I'm not sure that it came across in some of the testimony earlier, but, you know, you know, we really view EPP standards as the floor. Uh, that is the bare minimum, right? And so we do try our best to apply other more current standards where they're applicable. So for example, EPA has standards, OSHA has standards for uh, employee related products, FDA has standards on antimicrobial products. We're pulling all of those uh, other standards in as well. And EPP is really just like the floor. Um, and we're happy to actually see that these standards are going to be updated. Uh, we think it's time. We agree with our colleagues on the phone. Uh, and, and I'm happy to sort of, say, again, report out that a lot of the products that we buy actually go above and beyond our current EP standards. Uh, great answer. Uh, our legislation would like to go from our electronic standards from Energy Star to the uh, federally recognized uh, EP. Is that a standard we've already been seeking or is it just a standard where it's something you would support? Uh, it's absolutely something that, that we would support. And I would I, I would want to dig into a little bit more to see whether or not there are specific procurements where we are already doing that or have considered uh, that, that particular standard. Great. Uh, we have two specific examples of uh, goods that um, we didn't see in the EPP and we were curious. So we saw an, a, a, a plumbing fixtures procurement award in the amount of $513,715. Uh, they are EPP eligible goods. 
and uh, they, I don't believe that they were uh, documented. So I guess the question is, is it that the items were not, did not meet the standards and we didn't get the waiver or uh, we didn't need the waiver because they met the standards, but they just didn't make it into the uh, appendix E report. You know, off the top of my head, I really don't know, but I will double check. I, I will take that back to, to the staff and look into that one. You said it was plumbing papers. Do you have the actual like reference? And we can take uh, that. We'll, back. we'll get it to you. Uh, yeah. But I, I guess the, the, the broader question is, it seems that the number is artificially, that, that there's something wrong with the number 411 million, given a $22 billion budget. Um, also, if we look at the construction procurement, it was $28 billion. And again, uh, so I guess, could you speak to why more of the construction procurement, which is 2.8 billion, wasn't included in the EPP? Because the, of the 411, it's kind of split evenly between goods and uh, uh, construction. So I think that that's really a question for MOPS uh, to answer. Okay. So we just report what the agencies uh, are sending to us. But if um, if the question is why, if if the suggestion is that there are updates made based off of the numbers, then that's what we can take. Uh, to be, let, let me be as crystal clear as possible. I would like somebody's job to wake up in the morning and be focused on it and to be looking at the contracts and making sure that the, that every agency is spending as much money as they can to save our planet because it is a climate emergency. And that if we are buying plumbing fixtures for $513,000, we are either having it listed on the EPP system through Passport, as you mentioned, or that they're getting a waiver. Or I guess the, the third option is it's not covered by this for whatever reason, whether it's an emergency or something else, but that that also, I think the legislation as amended would hopefully also uh, report on that, but um, just having somebody paying attention to this and, um, because it's, it's $22 billion we could use to save the planet. So I guess, how can we, how can we do that and, and force more of the $22 billion into uh, the EPP? Yeah, so I'll, I will um, defer to MOS, but that's part of the work that's being done in updating the standards. And so I'll defer to my colleagues at MOS who can talk a little bit more about um, that work. Um, again, I think that for us, we're really focused on what is the most, uh, what, what are the innovations that are currently at play, right? We're reviewing all, a lot of the um, um, organizations that set standards for products and goods. Um, enforcement is a different category of issues. I think we have a lot of ideas about how we might um, ensure that more of our um, city dollars and purchasing power is on the right kind of product that can assist us uh, with the climate crisis. I think we need everyone, right? Um, in order to be able to really track it appropriately and be able to know that um, it is being enforced. Um, and so I think that there's um, also a way that we can have more incentives um, for our agencies, the same way, way that we say, uh, uh, respond to uh, MWBE procurement, right? So maybe there are ways that we can um, incentivize um, higher uptake um, by our sister agencies. But again, our role is purely uh, advisory on this research side of the equation, like what's the state of play? Uh, if any of my colleagues have any questions, please raise your hand, we'll make sure to call on you. So it sounds like Mox is saying we're, we're administrative. MOS is um, uh, advisory. Uh, I, so I guess who, who can be the person? Does it need to be the mayor? Is it the deputy mayor? Is it a deputy mayor for the environment? Who, who, who is the one who, who can, who can tell agencies you're gonna have to 
use, uh, I, I saw on the list, delineators. And I know way too much about delineators. Uh, they are used by the Department of Transportation for bike lanes and other things. And we do a lot around safe streets in my district. So I know probably more than I should about delineators. So uh, there's environmental standards for how much of that should be uh, from recycled materials versus non-recycled materials. Who can be the person who once we get the updated standards from you later this year, can make sure that those standards keep getting updated when the recommendations come out and can put their, their, their fist down or their, their bike tires down with DOT and say, you're going to buy delineators that meet the standards. Yes, yeah, so I would. I just would like to say that I think that you, the the right people are here. Um, you've got MOS that will be able to say they are poised to be able to say this is what should be covered in the standards. This is what is best practices. This is what is out there in the field right now, right? And then you have mocks here who will push through with the Kappa process, get up, you know, move the uh, uh, standards through. Um, ensure that the, uh, the appropriate compliance questions are integrated into the procurement process and continue to make um, it visible uh, to the public. So I think it's a combination of both, which is uh, what we're trying to say. It's, it's, you have both of the, the parties. And then of course you have DCAS here too, who uh, you know, have huge spend in the goods categories. Um, who will be weighing in. And I should mention that um, when MOS comes to us with their set of um, proposals of what should be included in the standards, we then go out to agencies as well for their review, for their additional comments, uh, ensure they understand what the proposals are. So um, I think it's a, an integrated collaborative process um, that will yield updates. In, 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 I guess what it, so we've got this $1.8 billion in spending in goods. We have $2.3 billion in spending in constructions, but we're only seeing $400 million going through environmental preferable purchasing. And so some things must be getting a waiver. Have any of you seen anyone ever request a waiver uh, from having to follow the environmental preferable purchasing? Uh, I think in a recent conversation we all had, um, there's only been one request for a waiver that we all can uh, account for um, in the history of this. So um, the implication is that agencies understand what uh, is required of them and they're following the rules and requirements of the EPP laws. Now, what you're flagging here today and we, uh, you know, concur is that there needs to be an update, right, to the standards. And with that update, um, you know, one would expect that you would see greater spend um, uh, for goods and uh, construction related procurement um, in the EPP regulations. Uh, Director Guiling, you mentioned the uh, passport system. So when somebody is try trying to uh, submit a bid, for delineators or paint or concrete, is it a checkbox where they say that uh, this is the, um, that, that I meet EPP standards or does Passport actually have fields? So I'm just looking at your guide. Uh, for the folks who wanna follow along, if you go to the uh, MOX website, uh, let me just go to it again in one second. So, it's www.triplew1.nyc.gov slash site slash mock slash index.page. And if you click on partners and then EPP, uh, it takes you to the environmentally preferable purchasing page. And then there's two links in terms of minimum standards for goods and construction products. So there's some things that actually appear on both like flexible delineators. Uh, so if you click goods, it'll bring you to a, uh, document that is only 247 pages where you can find a list of things. So on page 167, uh, sorry, uh, on yeah, page 167 for the fixed delineators, not the flexible delineators, uh, it has a requirement that the plastic be 25 to 90% uh, post-consumer content. 
and that any rubber must be 100% post-consumer content. Uh, are people making bids required to enter in what levels of post-recycled content they have, or how, how do you guarantee compliance with the EPP? Yeah, so the way, um, it's a great question, and so I and appreciate you asking that too, um, and uh, here with a lot of folks tuning in. Uh, so the way that the procurement process works is that the agency drafts the solicitation, so the invitation to propose or the invitation to bid, um, and they draft that with the requirements uh, that uh, are necessary um, to be responsive. And then they evaluate uh, the responses that come in to ensure that uh, they are compliant with the requirements of the solicitation. Um, and that's part of their determination as to who the award uh, will be um, ultimately uh, given to. So um, that's the back and forth. Um, and the, re the EPP requirements come in as part of the design of the solicitation. So what I was referencing before is the agency if the agency is going out to solicitate to solicit um, goods or services that have um, EPP implications, they will have to um, acknowledge that their solicitation uh, complies with the EPP laws uh, before they can even release that solicitation. Where is that track? Like, how do we how do we have how do we get a because your answer went exactly where my mind was going. Like. Do we have, I, I, I wrote the city record online. I, I used to be GovOps chair, DCAS is my favorite agency. Also it's like the biggest agency no one's ever heard of. And I, I don't say, mean that as an insult. It's just like the city records, the most important newspaper no one's ever read. Uh, and, and like I say that all kidding aside, but uh, so I guess, is it that, so, so where is the list of, of RFPs that have gone out that are in EPP or not? Is it something where we wanna have DCAS add to the city record online some sort of indicator so we can do a search and, and just do search for EPT pieces. Like, how do we tell at the outset which, which uh, procurements are within EPT and which ones aren't? Because it sounds like we're trying to do it on the back end instead of the front end. Um, so great question. Let me uh, let us come back to you um, with how we can use the information that we have in the system um, to answer that question. Okay, hold on one second. I'm, just gonna... I'm grabbing my copy of the uh, city record. I, uh, I, I keep copies of it in my office. Uh, I love the city record. Does anyone have their copy of today's city? This one's a little bit older. It's, it's one of the ones I keep around for profit. Did everyone read the city record this morning? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, for those watching at home, so the city record is how the city tells you when we're buying things, when you can bid on things. It also tells you like when we're going to uh, rezone your block or, or take your, your take a piece of land on your block and do something with it. So like, Again, it's the most important paper, but uh, few, few people read it. I feel like more, most people should. Um, so yeah. Uh, so it would be helpful to get an answer from, from the three of you at some point very soon in the next week, just how we can tag things that are starting out as solicitations for whether or not we think they should be covered and then making sure that what's covered in there that um, the items cite the requirements from the standards or refer to the standards. Uh, and if not, that we're getting a waiver piece there. Um, so the legislation has a, a number of goals and I, I'm not sure if uh, you spoke to them. So I just, wanted to see. So um, I, I already asked uh, DCAS, but so does the administration support uh, following the federal government in 2007, uh, Amazon in 2010 and 43 other countries in adopting electronic product environmental assessment tool EP standards? I have like a list of five or six. So the, the sooner we can get yeses or noes or I don't know is the better. 
So I think there were some questions um, from council before the hearing around um, electronic products um, that we made some connections um, to uh, DSNY around. So I'm happy to follow back up on this question as it may pertain to um, the other set of questions around electronic products. Uh, should the city adopt new ambitious uh, standards? So the old standard in the EPP used to be decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, should we be seeking to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, with relate, relating to our city's purchasing? We are currently evaluating the standards that exist and again looking for opportunities where the products are the state of the art in helping to get us to net zero. Again, there are many other factors that also come into consideration, including ensuring that we have competitors in the market offering those products. And so, yes, we'll, we're continuing to uh, do those evaluations and Chair Callas, we appreciate your leadership on this. If you want to go ahead and share the standards, the specific standards you have in mind, it is more helpful to get them now uh, from you. They, so, they, they are in the draft that. legislation. They're in what we provided to the administration Great. last week, the week before, and I think over the months that we were drafting. So, uh, so that is a yes to net zero greenhouse gas emissions, uh, replacing just decreasing them. I think the mayor already came out and said he wanted to have net zero greenhouse gas emissions from our city. You don't have to take my word for it, though. Uh, I, I, so, so yes, no, maybe so. I said yes, we're looking into that. Great, eliminate reliance on virgin materials. That's a new standard. Uh, we are all in support of these goals that you're stating now, for sure. Amazing, eliminate reliance on hazardous substances instead of yes. <laughs> Improve outdoor air quality. That's a new one. Yes. Reduce the negative effects and even generate positive effects for the environment from our procurement. Sure, Carlos. These are literally the goals of our research. We are trying to ascertain Amazing. what standard making bodies are have on 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 lists that achieve those goals. Yes. Amazing. Uh, and, and part of this is if I get you on record saying yes, it makes it a lot easier when we pass these in negotiation. Uh, prohibit the purchase of halogen lamps. I, That's I an expansion from incandescence. Is that yes, no, maybe so, or all of the above? Probably maybe so. Again, okay. we're still evaluating. And again, this is a collaborative process. We submit recommendations to agencies and then they, there was a lot more, including the CAPA process, right? There was a lot more feedback and uh, sausage making that happens before those standards come out. So it's not about whether I, we, our office is personally on board with these ideas. It's also about what is the CAPA process going to land us in. Uh, one thing that wasn't in our bill in terms of lamps is I, I hate fluorescent bulbs. Um, I've also been advised that there may be a lot of mercury in them. Uh, and so I guess one thing to just throw on there that we'd be looking for in an A version is not only the current ban on incandescence and expanding to halogens, but I would love to go after the fluorescence and just replace it all with LEDs if possible. Uh, that one we didn't give you ahead of time. Any, any thoughts on that? from an environmental point of view, sounds reasonable to me. Okay. Uh, adding furniture to environmental procurement. So uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Burick mentioned that furniture currently isn't covered. Uh, how much furniture do we buy and should we include it? Um, we are definitely exploring furniture. We think that that is one of the areas of the, of the legislation that we can uh, absolutely take into advisement, yes. I'm, I'm curious, how much furniture do we buy as a city? We have like 350,000 employees and we're about to like go through crazy shenanigans to make it safe for people to go back to work in like a week and three days. Uh, well, I think in the last three years, our average uh, off of our citywide contracts has been about like nine to 12 million per year. That's a lot of furniture. 
it's a lot of employees. <laughs> Uh, before the hearing, we had requested a the recycling, uh, the the plan, the, the 2008. So the city was required to develop a plan by January 1st, 2008, for the reuse and recycling of electronics devices. Uh, I don't believe we received that plan yet. Are you able to provide that today, uh, or just tell us what the plan is? So I think this is what I was referring to before. I think we've made a connection with um, contracts committee um, to the agency that manages that. So uh, happy to uh, reconnect. I'm looking at some emails from yesterday. Uh, so I think that, that that connection has been made so that you can get that information. Okay, so um, it would have been helpful to just have sanitation here or get the answer from them ahead of time. Uh, do, do any of the three of you know, like, how to dispose of electronics at your agency? So, like, if DCAS has a, so I'm, I'm certain all of you have had a, a technology device, whether it is a phone, a laptop, or a computer get replaced. Do any of you know what happened to the old one and what your agency did with it? Yeah, so we coordinate with the Department of Sanitation which currently has the contract for for uh, uh, e-waste uh, removal. Uh, what happens after that, I have no idea, but that is the route that we take. We reconnect with sanitation. Um, we do that contract. Do you, do you, I think you gave it, you, you gave a straightforward answer for a person who didn't get the question ahead of time. So like, if you are a resident, any resident, pretty much anyone in Manhattan who lives in a building with I think six or more units or 10 or more units, you can go to the DSNO website you can get an electronics recycling cage uh, that you can put in your basement uh, or in wherever your trash room is. And that way you don't have to find a place to bring your electronics. You can just leave it there. When it's full, your building calls sanitation. They come, they empty it out. They work with the uh, vendors to either uh, work with the existing recycling programs or the city does it ourselves. Um, so is it, is it basically you're just tapping into that program? Do you have a DSNY electronics recycling cage somewhere at DCAS? I don't know, I'll have to check. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm off the top of my head, I don't know, but I'll check. Fair enough. Uh, and then back to the EP. So when we did ask about EP, uh, so that's the federal standard uh, for electronics. Uh, again, Amazon's doing it. I, I hate to say anything nice about George Bush, but like literally, a Republican President George Bush, who he was the worst before the most recent one. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Like, but he he actually adopted it. Is there any reason why the city couldn't adopt the same EP standards that the federal government adopted 14 years ago under uh, a, an administration that was particularly hostile to the environment? You know, I am uh, not familiar with the EP uh, details here, unfortunately, but again, uh, what we are trying to do is align with what the feds and the states uh, are requiring and all of the updates that they do. It's also why we, uh, as an approach, try to also look at standard making bodies like Green Seal and an Energy Star and so an ASHRAE, right? So because then if we reference those, the, the, the official standard making bodies, when updates happen, which happen um, more often uh, at the national level, then we automatically can be referencing that higher level standard, right? So that's that would be part of the approach that we are undertaking. Uh, we're happy to look into it. And uh, again, we're still in the, in the middle of a very extensive review. Uh, there are hundreds of products, as you can imagine, uh, as part of this uh, EPP. So we, we definitely have a lot of work uh, and very uh, limited uh, capacity to do it, but we're, we're chugging through it. Uh, ahead of the hearing, we asked for a copy of the green cleaning products list. Uh, were you able to provide that or can you direct me to where it would be on the web, on the city government's website? So we provided the, um, the committee uh, with a link. They're codified into New York City rules. Um, so it's uh, RCNY section 11-10. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
the uh, law requires the director to establish packaging reduction guidelines with relation to city purchasing of goods. Uh, do you know how often this gets reviewed uh, and if we can have a copy of the guidelines that have been established? We can definitely have a copy of the guidelines that have been established. Um, how frequently they're reviewed, I don't know if that is, um, uh, and I can circle back with you um, on that, if that is wrapped into a regular review of the standards. So according to the uh, environmental preferable purchasing law, the city is, uh, is supposed to conduct a survey once every four years of construction vendors purchasing. Uh, do you know when the last survey completed was and where the results are? I can circle back with you on that and let you know where they are. Uh, we did our best to, to go give it everything to you ahead of time so you could have it for us. Some things we were able to get from you because you were able to direct us how to find it on the website, which can be very difficult to find. Uh, the legislation does require more of these reports. In fact, I think almost all of these reports to be sent to the city council and to be posted on your website so that we can keep track of these things and so that folks aren't stuck in a situation of saying, well, I don't know, um, do you support putting these online so that there's more transparency around the process and so that if MOS makes recommendations, those recommendations are public uh, ahead of those implementations and those implementations are also public. I just want to. Um, I just want to get back because I went online to to just find them. They act, the the um, packaging reduction is on our website and it's in the last tab of the EPP report. Okay, so it's under reporting or partners. It's under um, Mox Partners Environmentally Preferable Purchasing dot page. And when you go to EPP, you'll see the EPP. Okay. Uh, the other documents have a date. Do you know when the last time this document was updated? Let me take a look. I'm looking at the file name in the URL, which ends with a 1-14-14. And as a person who uses a similar file name in convention, I, I believe that this was last updated January 14th, 2014. Um, just can please bear with me. Um, um, I am looking at the Adobe document properties, which have it as created January 16th, 2014 at 1.48 p.m. Yeah. So, um, so yes, it is, the date is right. Um, my understanding is there's, um, so we should update it, but my understanding is that there's not an update requirement for them, but perhaps as part of this larger effort to update, we can look at that and talk about that with you as well. So I guess, for DCAS, is the packaging reduction guideline something that you use in purchasing? I believe we make certain references to it. And I know that in the last two years, we've participated in the survey uh, that Mox had performed with our vendors uh, to collect information on, on what they're currently doing uh, on the guidelines. But uh, specifically, which which ones, uh, you know, I would have to get back to you on that. But, but we do reference um, um, pieces of it in our specifications. Do you know how successful we've been in eliminating uh, polystyrene foam, commonly known as styrofoam packaging and PVC packaging? I believe um, that, uh, I believe that, you know what, let me get back to you. Let me not be wrong here. So let me, or let me get back to you and get you the right answer. Okay. I don't want to, yeah. 
<laughs> so for, for MOS, have you, re have you recently reviewed the uh, packaging reduction guidelines? Uh, sorry, um, I am not sure, but let me circle back with you as well. Okay. And, and like, just to be clear, like all of these things were supposed to be getting reviewed every four years, every two years. And so to me, what would have been a much better hearing is just to just say like, to, to have answers of like, no, we haven't done it or we have, and here's what we did versus an I don't know, which um, I just, I really believe in accountability. And I, I think that if, if we fell short, we, we own up to it, we let people know, and then we, we do our best to do better. Um, I just feel that a lot of the, I, I don't know, is it's just, it's, it's not really holding ourselves accountable. And I think we're, we're better than that. I think that's the end of my questions on 2271. Uh, I'd like to move on to the textiles. Uh, I uh, made the mistake of Googling this. Uh, and if anyone under knows what cookies are, uh, other than delicious and a song I sing with my daughter about what C is for, uh, you, you know that uh, if you Google something, you get ads about it. So no sooner did I Google uh, um, you know, sustainable fabrics, did I get a commercial from H&M with Maisie Williams extolling their 100% uh, pieces. And I, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. So like, it was really cool. Like I, I might actually go to H&M now. Uh, so uh, what type of textiles does the city regularly purchase? Um, I, I can answer that. I mean, on our requirements contracts, we have, you know, uh, every, everything from like mattresses, uniforms, uh, we even have upholstery, uh, furniture is big as well. Uh, that includes textiles. So yeah, there's a lot of textiles that the city purchases. That is amazing. I did not, I, I was struggling to find, I didn't know that we bought mattresses and things like that. What agencies buy the most textiles? Um, you know, I'd have to get back to you. I think the big users are, are likely going to be uh, our human client service agencies. So ACS, HRA, DHS, um, and DOC is a big uh, uh, purchaser as well. Department of Corrections. Yes, sorry. D Department of Corrections, that's right. Uh, so, the oh, other ones are for, for Department of Homeless Services, Human Resources Administration, that's and what was, right. the, what was it? and then what was the other one? Administration for Children's Services? That's right, yep. And so they're providing clothing for people who are, who are in our jails. They are providing uh, sheets and, and other things for people who are That's in the shelters. Do we provide and of course, clothing? Our agencies as well. I don't want to forget them as well. Um, every uniform you see out on the street. So we buy them. They don't have to buy it. The, the, the workers don't have Police officers and fire officers don't have to buy their own clothing. I do not work for those two agencies, so I can't answer that question, but, but uniforms are on our, on our citywide contracts. <laughs> uh, I, to the extent you can get us an answer on which uniformed employees are responsible for buying their own uniform versus us buying them for them uh, would be helpful. I know for the fire department, we actually buy their boots because I, I worked with the fire officers to buy a second pair of boots for folks so that they wouldn't have to go out on a call wearing wet boots after they already just did a call um, so they can get time for their boots to dry. Uh, do we know how much money we are spending every year on just like the textile piece of procurement? No, um, but only because textile could really be like an element of something, right? So our procurement could be furniture, uh, but then like textiles might be like an element of that. And so um, we don't really have it broken up by material in, in that way. Um, but, you know, we could, we could probably um, go through our list of contracts and see which ones might be applicable. I, I'm, open, I'm looking forward to hearing from advocates. I think we're, I, I will, I'm actually, they have the expertise. So does my staff on this one. I, I had quite a crash course before this hearing. I imagine uniforms, sheets, things that folks are, where, where it's almost probably a certain percentage or more textiles would be what we're most interested in. But if you can share that, it would be incredibly helpful. 
Do you know yeah. if there are currently any standards on sheets, towels, uh, beds, uh, mattresses, uh, uniforms? Do we have any standards to guide are, our purchase of textiles? Yeah, there, I mean, there are some like standards, right? Like, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, flame resistant, uh, you know, sheets are a thing and you want to make sure that things are not catching fire. And so there are certain standards there. Um, there are, uh, there are like the other EPA standards as well. I mean, we can pull which ones we're currently tapping into and which stand what guidelines we're currently using. Um, uh, and we can pull some of our contracts and reference that language if that would help. Do you know if the city currently, so fl flame retardant, I, I understand. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why I, I know how the measurements go for for uh, for, 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 uh, for for I believe all flame standards relate to how long before something catches fire because everything catches fire just how long before it melts or catches fire. Uh, I don't know why I know that. Uh, so the okay. city, <laughs> is that correct? Is that the standard? I believe you're right. I, and I think it's because you have kids because all of their PJs come with that standard. <laughs> oh, you, what do you call it? The, 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 yes, the flame retardant pajamas, like yeah. <laughs> they're so tight and so hard to get on a kid and every night is a fight. Oh. Okay, <laughs> I, I, Mercedes, you, do you have kids? Is that why you, you, you have lived through this too? <laughs> I'm still living through it. I have a nine-year-old and a one-year-old. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so do you, aside from the flame retardant, do you know if there's any environmental standards that we currently apply? Um, not off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I will ask my team if I get an answer before we end, I'll, I'll, I'll flag it for you, but otherwise I can follow up after this call. I'm just saying, sorry. Do you I know that Department of Sanitation does textile recycling. I know this because our office works with them to get buildings to voluntarily do it. Uh, do you know if um, any agencies have textile recycling or even upcycling? No, sanitation is the only one that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, is the city aware of any uh, local innovators in the field of sustainable textiles that are capable of producing products that meet the current safety standards for items such as work boots? I don't, I don't know if that's for me or for MOS. I do not know the answer. So I'm not aware um, of specific standards, but again, it's it, textiles are part of our current review. And so we're, I, I think one of the additional considerations that we are thinking through is mm -hmm. also the availability of the volume that, that the agencies would have to procure it. And um, just trying to understand more about the categories of purchasing that, uh, that the city actually mm -hmm. utilizes. So it's one thing to have access to a sustainable material, but we're not really, um, in a position to be able to comment on whether we can buy that at the volume that might be needed. So again, this is part of why our recommendations on sustainability go to the agencies that have to implement this program uh, for their feedback. And we're just not there yet in the process. And, and so I think that's what our bill kind of recognizes and I kind of um, hate task force bills, uh, but task force bills that then do something kind of something I can stomach. So do you think it would be helpful to have a task force set up that is going to research and consider the social costs associated with the productions of textiles, labor conditions, supply chain, and um, whether or not they're recycled or organic or virgin materials, and the source and supply chain, uh, getting a sense of the value of the contracts, how long they're used and how they're disposed? Um. Listen, I will tell you from MOS's perspective, um, I think that any uh, organized effort to help um, identify the state of uh, innovation uh, nationally and internationally would be welcome um, by us. Again, it is a tremendous um, undertaking and for us achieving a zero waste future in the textile industry is a very uh, is central to our goals, but at the same time is absolutely a nascent area of research. So we'll take all the help that we can get. 
to the extent that you've shared that there may not be a market or people who can produce the materials we need in an environmental sustainable way, and the fact that we have so much vacant office space, so much vacant manufacturing space, uh, and we are on the road to recovery, is there a way that we could use EPP as a market driver? And I guess along those same lines, does DCAS have any experience where the city set a new standard for something and then the market reacted, responded, and we created a market for an environmentally sustainable product? Uh, yeah, I can take the second part of that. And, and the answer is yes. I mean, DCAS um, years ago was one of the first uh, sort of groups to decide to use uh, biofuels uh, in their buildings. Uh, and we really drove the market there. Uh, we're now up to about... Uh, uh, 20% uh, biofuel, and we're also putting out a bid for uh, renewable diesel as well. And so I think that, you know, in 20 years ago, you didn't see that anywhere in the market. 10 years ago, that was hard to find. And now you're finding more and more vendors in the market who are providing uh, biofuels because DCAS is a, not just DCAS, sorry, the city as a user uh, has a tremendous volume and, and a tremendous footprint. Um, and so it's worth the effort to now bring in biodiesel to the city. So I think you're, you, you, you really are correct. I think when the city decides to, to move in a certain correct direction, uh, the market will follow. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, one last call to see if anyone else has any questions. Uh, I want to uh, thank DCAS uh, uh, and, uh, for, for joining. Uh, I also MOS, nice, nice to meet you and, and thank you Mox and just, uh, we have a lot of outstanding questions. So please make sure to provide them. Uh, please provide them as soon as possible. I believe the record remains open for 48 or 72 hours. So we would really like to be able to have whatever you provide in the record so that anyone who is interested in this issue is able to uh, learn, learn about it and get the answers as well. So please, if we can get it by, by Monday, uh, that would be amazing. Uh, I would like to uh, now at this point, excuse the uh, current panel and uh, turn it over to my committee council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, we'll now move on to public testimony. Um, bear with me for a second. Um, Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll now turn on to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in a typical council hearing, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Uh, please, once, you, once the sergeant has begun the timer, please begin. Um, council members who have questions for a particular panelist, use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant arms will set a timer and you can begin. Um, we will begin first with uh, Joshua Catcher, um, who I believe is uh, going to speak first. Go ahead, sir. And uh, uh, just one correction, we'll be giving five minutes for folks. Thank you for waiting so long into this hearing. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Welcome. Chair Carlos and members of the council and committee. My name is Joshua Catcher. I am a fashion designer and entrepreneur an author, an educator, and I sit on the board of directors for the international organization Collective Fashion Justice. As a fashion professional who lives in New York City, as well as a sustainable and ethical fashion educator and writer, I have seen lawmakers overlook fashion supply chains as deserving of meaningful legislation. Um, I have fa I've seen fashion not get taken seriously despite its massive global impacts on workers, animals, and the environment. And I've seen innovators, entrepreneurs, and small businesses focused on sustainable and ethical supply chains struggle desperately to access and navigate the complex city contracting opportunities. For example, I make sustainable, fairly made tactical boots, but have had no ability to speak to anyone who makes those purchasing decisions. Um, we have scientific data on what the most impactful textile materials are for the environment and we can make environmentally preferable purchasing of textiles based on this data. The HIG Material Sustainability Index, the Pulse of the Fashion Industry Report uh, from the Boston Consulting Group, 
and fas the fashion industry's own internal environmental profit and loss reports concur that the most environmentally impactful materials to produce from cradle to, from cradle to gate are silk, alpaca wool, cowskin leather, and conventional cotton and wool. These should be a starting point for textile purchasing decisions. These materials that rely on turning native lands and forests into graze land and pasture are some of the most harmful. We must rewild pasture and graze land for the sake of biodiversity and for the most effective carbon sinks as they relate to the climate crisis. Further consumer research shows that importantly, this is what citizens want. A 2020 McKinsey survey found two thirds of respondents believing that it's quote, important to limit impacts on climate change, while 88% believe that more attention should be paid to reducing pollution. Three consecutive years in a row, the study from List, which is an online retailer, the largest consumer studies ever conducted. First in 2018, 80 million shoppers showed a 66% increase in searches for sustainable fashion with terms vegan fashion responsible for over 9.3 million social impressions. List's 2019 study, which was over 104 million shoppers, showed searches including sustainability related keywords increasing 75% year on year. And the 2020 study, the most recent one, saw sustainable sneakers, for example, jumping another 89% year on year. At the same time, we are in the midst of an industrial revolution where waste diverted, recycled, biosynthetic, organic, and other visionary innovations are increasingly available. I call these materials circumfaunal materials that aim to replace climate, land, and water intensive animal fibers that are a significant portion of these innovations. New York City should be purchasing from these new supply chains, hoping, helping them flourish. The creation of a task force comprised of experts is a necessity for examining more ethical and sustainable supply chains for, th for the city of New York's purchasing. As a globally celebrated fashion capital, New York City should be leading by example. The truth is that we have thorough data, we have access to more and more innovative and sustainable materials, and we have the urgency of the climate crisis to make these changes, and there is a budget to do so. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. During the hearing, there was a, uh, at least an implication that uh, the private market might not be able to uh, meet needs. Uh, what is your capacity for these boots? Uh, and is it, would, would they be sufficient for fire department, police department, or other department needs? The boots that I make, um, in addition to typical uh, fashion boots and accessories. I also make tactical boots that meet uh, international stringent sets of standards. Um, I have a full data sheet on these boots that I'm happy to send rather than reading through all those standards. Um, and the capacity, for example, my small business, the factory that I work with that I contract located in Brazil, um, we, can, we can create up to 30,000 pairs of boots uh, per, per order. So there is the ability to scale. It's not as big as some others out there, but there is an opportunity to help um, smaller businesses like this provide. I think 30,000 pairs is a, is a decent number for, for a city purchase. And the materials you described, uh, should you feel that, that any, anything uh, shoe related should be included in the textile definition of textiles? Absolutely. Footwear, as a footwear designer and as a fashion professional, footwear has to be included in um, any sort of critical understanding of uh, materials and textiles at large and fashion at large. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. We will now move on to uh, Christopher Halfnight, um, followed, oh, followed by uh, Joel Kupferman afterwards. Go ahead. Good. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and committee members. My name is Chris Halfnight. I'm Associate Director of Policy at Urban Green Council. 
We're an environmental nonprofit focused on sustainability in the building sector. I'm testifying today in support of intro number 2271. And first I wanna say thank you to the chair, to the committee, and of course to the dedicated staff at city council for bringing some much needed attention to this important and impactful policy. Urban Green has a long history with the EPP. Russell Unger, our former executive director was actually the lead drafter on the council staff uh, back in 2005 when he worked at city council. Um, and then he worked at uh, Mox afterwards to help implement the law. More recently in 2016 and 2017, we collaborated with MOS and others on recommendations for a long overdue update to the rules uh, that implement the, the EPP laws. Um, we advised in particular on provi provisions related to buildings, including energy efficiency, water efficiency, and building materials. Um, as we've heard nearly five years later, none of the many recommendations that were put forward at that time have been implemented. I know it's not easy to shepherd these through revision and I'm hopeful, more hopeful than I was yesterday, based on the testimony today, uh, that we'll see some of those integrated later this year. So that was really nice to hear. Um, the city's green purchasing power is important in a number of ways. Uh, Chair Kalis, you highlighted them at, at the outset. The sheer quantity of public procurement translates to a significant environmental footprint. Every dollar that preferences a good with lower environmental impact benefits all New Yorkers. Second, the city's purchases create more demand for greener products, helping to stimulate the market. And then third, the city's green purchasing inspires action in other cities and states that look to New York and the private sector. As we've heard, it's been almost a decade since the regulations that implement the law have been updated. And, and I think it's clear that that's a gap that falls far short of the law's intent. So uh, we really applaud the committee's effort today to update the EPP laws. In particular, we support the proposed amendments to modernize the purpose statement to include achieving net zero GHG, eliminating waste and increasing recyclable materials. And then we'd offer four specific comments for the, the committee's consideration. First, given the history of uh, updates or lack thereof, we very much support the proposal to increase reporting requirements so that there's uh, some explanation and transparency around the mandatory biannual review uh, of the purchasing standards. Two, we're, we're really glad to see the EPEAT standards proposed for integration. We'd encourage the committee to consider a higher specification within EPEAT, such as gold or silver, or to require the director to implement the highest standard deemed feasible after the review that's proposed in the amendment. I'll note that some leading jurisdictions have opted for EPEAT gold or silver. Uh, Washington DC, for example, has that in their procurement standards. Third, we very much support the addition of environmentally preferable furniture standards. That was in our uh, recommendations as well a few years back. Um, and we also agree with the, the intent to align those standards with existing industry standards and eco labels that really helps ensure that they can be implemented in the easiest and most effective manner. And then fourth, we'd suggest uh, some focus on developing standards for a small number of additional products that aren't covered right now either in the law itself or uh, through the regulatory process in the, in the regulations. Um, and those, the, the top priorities for us there are consideration of cement standards, uh, such as maximum cement content or minimum cement substitute content, uh, particularly in the non-structural side of things. So precast concrete units and bag concrete mixes that can significantly lower the GHG impact of concrete. Second, we'd encourage looking at the US EPA's water sense label. Uh, that's a label for water efficiency and it's a, a convenient and accessible way to, to uh, sort of up the dial on that. And then third, some recycled content requirements for carpet, ceiling tile and wallboard. Those are all really important construction materials and uh, they're readily accessible with very high recycled content. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment today and uh, happy to answer any questions. I love everything you said, and uh, you answered you answered questions that I was going to ask. Uh, is Urban? Tell, can you tell me about your organization? Are are you uh, a combination? Do, do you have representatives from industry in your organization? 
Um, so we're a, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Uh, we include, um, I'm a lawyer by background. We have architects and engineers on staff, um, but we cover policy research, policy advocacy, a lot of education and workforce training, um, and then a lot of communications and, and sort of programmatic outreach. In our member group, we are a member organization. We have lots of design professionals, architects, engineers, energy management professionals, building owners, building managers. And then also on our board of directors, we have a wide representation across those groups as well. Is there anything that you saw in our legislation as drafted or as would be amended with your suggestions that the industry could not meet? I don't believe so. So we could do this. This wouldn't put anyone out of business. This wouldn't make it impossible for us to do business. This wouldn't raise costs uh, uncontrollably. Uh, this would be meeting the market where it may actually already be. As far as intro to uh, 2271, I believe that's the case. Um, you know, certainly would want to participate in the, the hearings to come as it moves through the regulatory process. But um, I can't speak specifically to the second bill today because we don't have expertise in the textile industry, but, but certainly on 2271. And we can eliminate virgin materials in construction? Uh, so I guess though, those particular provisions are, to my understanding, framed as a purpose statement, sort of goals to guide the EPP. Yep. I think that's an, an excellent goal. Whether we can fully eliminate virgin materials in construction, I think is a, a different question and, and would require quite a bit more consideration. Okay. Uh, and uh, any opinion on, on halogen lamps versus incandescents versus fluorescent versus LED? Um, yeah, so we, we actually looked at, at some of that back in 2016, 2017. Um, I think generally it's, it's very uh, clear that, that um, significant amounts of the lighting can transition to LED. There are some exception that gets, exceptions that gets quite technical. Um, my understanding of halogen, you know, and I'm not a lighting expert, but is uh, there are very good LED alternatives. So that one is, is likely uh, safe ground. The full phase out of fluorescence, I think gets, um, one of the issues we encountered when we were looking at it was there are uh, existing lighting infrastructure that would need to be replaced if all fluorescents were phased out. Um, so there are some older, larger uh, ballasts and such that, um, that maybe aren't as easy to transition to LED. And so the question there is less the technical feasibility and more the cost and uh, and sort of implementation burden it might mean as uh, existing bulbs die and, and the, you know, the, the schools, for example, are looking for bulbs to replace in existing fixtures. So we didn't get to the bottom of, of exactly what, you know, where the feasibility line lies there. Um, but uh, certainly directionally, I think that that's, that's the right direction. I when you mentioned, like, I, I just love LEDs over fluorescence any day personally, but when you mentioned schools, I just remember in class, like, trying to learn while, like, one fluorescent was buzzing, one of them was out, and one of them was, like, flickering, and I was <laughs> not the most ideal a learning environment. That's right. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll now move on to Joel Kupferman, followed by Kathy Nazari. Mark is ready. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to say that the testimony that I heard from your city commissioners and whatever is more than alarming. <laughs> um, I have more, more pessimistic um, after hearing them than before. There's a lot of questions that are raised um, and especially in terms of standards, with standards are being used, um, it's too vague. Um, you really have to make, make sure that these agencies consult with a lot more people to come up with the right standards. Um, it's going to be almost impossible to enforce those standards. Um, one, one of the things I just want to say, I'm, I'm, I'm Executive Director of the Environmental Justice Initiative and legal counsel to the Empire State Consumer Project, which deals with consumer um, 
concerns nationwide and, and, and New York City wise. One of the suggestions I make um, to add to this legislation is that you should require the contractors that the city hires to follow the same standards. Um, the city keeps on going into public private partnerships, hiring people and allowing the contractors to call the shots. I think one of the things that the city should do is, is to, to look into that. Um, the second um, question I have is that we just talked about electric um, lights and replacing the lights. The city, including um, schools, has a, has a history of bad contracting in terms of, of, of doing this work. Um, so when it came to replacing the, the, the PCBs laden um, fluorescent fixtures, there wasn't enough control over, over how they were removed endangering a lot of the kids that are there. So I think it's really important that the city look into that, that it's important that it's not just the, the product itself, but how these products get replaced um, is whatever. Number three is that we can, um, you should also look into a consortium of, of dealing with trying to bring um, some of this research on with New York State and other cities that are out there um, is three, four, is that it's really single use packaging is bad um, and, and it's good to, to go into recyclables, um, recycled uses, but there's no mention really that it's COVID-19 problem, all right? That a lot of it is medically, um, um, there's medical necessities um, for certain products. So the health department and other agencies should be consulted. There's gotta be a lot more research and substantiation of which, which standards should be used and which products should be um, used. And um, this, the city also passes these many, many laws, but has a problem with enforcement. The city is still owed a billion and a half in uncollected fines. Um, and so I, you know, I think there should be something here um, in terms of um, vendors to the city, if they get caught, not, you know, if, if, <laughs> misrepresenting what they're selling or buying or not following it, that they should be basically named a bad actor and there should be something, you know, there should be some type of control and who, you know, who they're being contracted. Um, and what else is there? And I think the standards, uh, just, just going back to that, this should, there's gotta be um, just more and much more science since, you know, substantiation that's out there. You just can't take industry lists without speaking to other agencies. You know, I see that it's there, but I don't think it's, you know, it's a really, really big requirement. And um, I also urge you to include NYCHA um, as, one, as one of the, you know, to be, to be considered in, uh, in these procurement um, requirements. Hey, Joel, if you can help us get this state, which has long since abandoned NYCHA and stopped funding it and uh, are some of the worst landlords in the world to turn over full control right, but, of the city. But, but, I also want to, but also, this is a criticism of the city. Let me just tell you something. There's a water problem. I represent the, the Tennis Association at Smith, yep. right? $85 million contract. The contractor got hit with an $80 million fine for labor violations, all right? They, their work, they expose lead laden soil that's there. We asked them to cover up the soil with geotextiles. They weren't forced to do it, all right? Yeah. So, okay, so part of the problem is the city rewarded them with another $250 million worth of contract. And so it scares me that right now with this exposure to lead, we just found out there's, you know, there's, there's lead exposure there. We've asked the health department to come in the health department's not coming in. And Chairman, I just want to say that they, when NYCHA residents call 311, they're told that they have to call NYCHA, that the health department or other agencies aren't there. So, so all these agencies are not coming in. At a taxi no. let me just, why this is really, let me, just, let, me just, let me just get to it, all right? The important point is right now, we were just told that all these other agencies, you know, your, your, your three agencies are going to consult with, DEP and DEC, you know, um, in terms of these standards, I'm saying that we have a major problem here. I agree, and we need Albany to repeal the Erstat law 
and have stopped having corrupt Albany legislators messing with our rent laws, and we need them to repeal the laws that keep NYCHA outside the purview of the city council. But the city, okay, but the city's agencies are not responding to outright, you know, environmental insults there. So now... Joe, I, I love the work you do. We just banned pesticides yesterday. I know about all the litigation you've done leading the way. We've been working with you and everybody else. And on uh, terms of the stuff going on with Smith's houses, uh, uh, which... Where is that, where is Smith House is located? The Brooklyn Bridge and East River. Um, let, let's let's touch base and see if we can help uh, do the constituent service there and make sure that the agencies that are appropriate are doing their jobs. Okay, but just going back to the bad actor policy, all right, the city could be using that to stop the hiring of contractors and even the contractors providing the bad products. They haven't been doing that. When the last times they did it, is that we're involved with the West Nile virus spraying? Is you, you know, you well aware? Okay. So we will we will we'll we'll take a look at that. So, but we'll take your feedback on the legislation. Thank you, Joel. Can I just say one more thing, or? Of course. Okay. I think it's important that you also reach out to um, CUNY and other people to help you know with with, with establishing these standards, and that the reporting requirements that that. The agencies you discussed this morning are not coming through. It just really takes away the veracity of, of, of what you're trying to do. And also it's opening yourself up to, to law, you know, legal actions that <laughs> the law is not substantiated. So it's, it's really bad that um, there was just <laughs> non-compliance by the three, four agencies that you, you know, you're charging them you know, to set these standards. I agree that there was non-compliance. I believe I shared it. I also agree that there was a lack of accountability and taking responsibility. And I, I would love to have better regulation and oversight over CUNY as a SUNY graduate myself, uh, and would love your help getting Albany to take their corrupt hands off of NYCHA, off of CUNY, off of H plus H, so that the city can properly regulate these agencies that purely serve New York City residents. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll now move on to Kathy Nazari. You may begin. Clock is ready. Good afternoon, Chairman Kalos and members of the committee. I'm Kathy Nazari, member of several boards, including legislative chair of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. Thank you, Councilman Kalos, for your EPP bills. I fully support intros 2271 and 2272 and will do my best to advocate for them and urge the council to pass them. The city must use its procurement power to shift to environmentally preferable purchasing of goods and textiles. Intro 2272 lays bare the environmental impacts of everything from uniforms to furniture to electronic equipment. It clearly illustrates the intersectionality of the environmental crisis with social justice issues like labor exploitation, public health, and animal cruelty. As a society, we must look at the consequences of our disposable culture and make mindful decisions. I vote with my wallet. To me, that means boycotting companies that do not treat their workers fairly, contribute to pollution and the degradation of the planet, and do not employ cruelty-free practices. I do so even if it is personally inconvenient. Our government has an obligation to do the same. Rather than purchase the cheapest product possible, our city must factor in the external costs of goods and textiles, such as how the manufacturing process harms the environment, endangers certain animal species, exploits workers, and causes human health problems. While a McDonald's hamburger might cost only a dollar, its production wreaks havoc on the planet and animals. Eat a steady diet of them and face a host of health issues, burdening our healthcare system, leading to rising insurance rates, loss of earnings and productivity due to sick leave, and so on. We don't honestly know the true cost of that dollar burger, but it is safe to say it's a lot more than a $15 organic salad. We need to apply that same logic to the city's purchasing. $12 scrub might be cheap, but they won't last long, which means they'll end up in a landfill or incinerator, 
At that price, the manufacturer is probably not paying a fair wage to its workers. The materials are subpar and they will have to be replaced sooner rather than later. So those $12 scrubs actually cost a lot more than a better quality product made from innovative, sustainable, toxic-free, recycled or recyclable materials. Again, I fully support these bills and would ask the language include incineration alongside landfill, since we know that Manhattan's trash is burned at the Cabanta facility in Newark, New Jersey, which brings with it a host of social costs like high asthma rates that cannot be ignored. We need to act now. The city must use its $22 billion purchasing budget in a responsible way that protects the taxpayers who fund it. If the city does not have the power to demand that social costs be evaluated in determining who gets our purchasing contracts, then we need to lobby the state for this power, or we just continue to fund harm to ourselves, to the planet, and to all its inhabitants. I also commend you for holding city agents accountable to the existing EPP laws. Please pass 2271 and 2272. I thank you for your time. And I just wanted to respond to a question you had earlier about e-waste. The um, DSMY has a contract with a third party who, um, who receives those materials. They will remove anything that is, um, is recyclable, can be sold to a, a, a company that does purchase products that can be recycled, and the rest of it goes to landfill. Kathy, that makes me very sad. I thought there was something where like, if we, if, if Apple made an iPhone or an iPad that uh, if you took it back to Best Buy or somebody who sells it, that uh, they then send it back to Apple and Apple has a responsibility to like take it apart and make sure that it is disposed of property or reused. Is that not the case? Well, if you bring it to a private company, I don't know what they do with it. But if you're talking about the e-waste program through the, the Department of Sanitation. That's what I was referring to. So uh, yeah, I would, that, that, that's horrifying. So if you throw away an Apple product uh, and literally they're up to iPhones 12 now, then so like whatever they can't recycle, which is most of it just ends up in a landfill and, and those things are highly toxic. What do they do with, do you know what they do with the toxic parts, which is most of it? I, that goes in the landfill. I mean, at least if you, um, I know, say with uh, T-Mobile, if I were to bring an old phone of mine to T-Mobile, they refurbish them and then they will um, Got it. They will sell them if they can. But with Department of Sanitation, that's not their, um, that's, that's not what they do. Okay, that is disappointing. It's very disappointing. Very thank, upsetting. You, thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Okay, Lewis, that's um, it for the public uh, section of the testimony. I want to thank everyone who came out today. Uh, I want to thank the administration for their testimony, all three agencies, uh, our advocates. If uh, you are watching at home, and it's within 72 hours of April 23rd, uh, and you are interested in submitting testimony, uh, you can do so. Uh, and I'll ask our committee council to share that email address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Uh, if you have anything you wish to share, you can share it with me at contracts at benkalos.com. Uh, Earth Day, this Earth Day, we banned uh, pesticides just yesterday in our city parks. And uh, it would be amazing to pass this legislation as soon as possible. We'll be taking feedback. We've heard ideas for improvements. We're hoping to get a lot more answers out of the administration. Uh, you'll be able to uh, find the testimony as well as any of the answers that we may or may not get at council.nyc.gov. And I wanna thank everyone for all of their hard work. We've been working on this for years uh, and uh, the entire team at the city council. All that being said, 